So session after lunch is never easy, and I hope you had a good lunch. Uh, and it's quite nice to have a siesta. <laughs> but we have a pretty full agenda, and I'm sure our next speaker, Laura, whom I'm going to call just in a minute, uh, will wake you up <laughs> with all the great stuff that's been happening in Mexico City uh, with her being there. Uh, but before that, I had a few comments to make, and I'll use the privilege of being the moderator to say those things because I did not get the chance to actually ask my question in the previous session. <laughs> I think we need to make a difference, uh, you know, a, a very clear difference between what we mean by equality and equity. And equality and equity are not one and the same thing. You know, equality is saying, okay, you have a so-called level playing field, but often the playing field is not level. And what we need is fairness and not equality as things stand. And you know, also there's this whole idea that somehow merit is, is paramount, but the truth is that merit is often a privilege you know, which you know, people have gotten. And it's just not about gender, but in general, that we look at that, that merit is often a privilege and merit is in some senses a matter of oppression because you can use the term merit and not give opportunities to women. So I think we should be very clear that we need to, you know, if we want to have a level playing field, we need to first bring it to the level playing field, so to speak. And that's where equity really comes. And the second thing is that the needs of women and the needs of men are not exactly the same. And the needs of poor women and the needs of rich women are not one and the same. So we need to be sure that we are meeting the needs of all. And it might mean very different solutions there. So let's make sure that we do that. Uh, and just for that, uh, you know, I'm also gonna use this opportunity to talk about a publication uh, that we did on, on women and transportation and how do we make sure that we make our cities uh, you know, great for women, you know, safe for women, but also responsive to the needs of women. Uh, so you can download this document, you have some copies down there. This is a publication that we did, ITDP, along with Safety Pin, who was one of the speakers this afternoon. And also there's another policy document that's just come out. It's on gender and sustainable urban mobility. Again, something that you can download. Cards are out on, on the table. So with that, uh, I'd like to call Laura. Uh, Laura's been a great friend. Uh, we've known each other for many years. And she's been doing some phenomenal work in Mexico City. And We'd like Laura to come up here. She's, she's been the head or the minister for transportation in the city of Mexico and now is standing for the position of a senator, from what I understand. So welcome. Hi, everybody. How are you? Great. Great. Yay. <laughs> OK, well. I promise that I will be very quick with this because I think that lunch, the after lunch is always hard. Um, well, let's start. That's supposed to be me, or at least a political product that it is supposed to be me. Uh, but well, I am not that. So let's start. So the question is who I am, who I am really uh, am. Um, I was born in 1982 in a small and conservative town nearby Mexico City called Querétaro, just at the beginning of the millennial generation. And I, feeling, I was feeling that in every single part of my soul since I was born. So imagine that, that picture. I built myself as an open-minded person, but in an ultra-conservative society. And I think that most of you feel the same with this. Maybe that is why, since I have memory, I am a person leaving a generational gap let's say kind of a betweener, who was always being told to choose a side and push it away for being different. This is a picture of me taking a, a seat in the Congress. Uh, my first job, official job in politics, was to be a Congresswoman in Mexico City local Congress. The one in pink, it's me. I think I'm the only one <laughs> over there. Uh, and that's part of, of the right that I want to tell you today. Uh, for example, in politics, I have been working in politics the last 70 years, and no matter what, political groups still see me as an outsider. 
because my gender, my ideology, my age, and of course my millennial disruptive way of thinking. But on the other hand, the civil groups also see me as a foreigner because my active participation in politics, you know that's very mainstream for the young people. As I said, I always have been a, begin a betweener. Nevertheless, I never choose a side because I understood a long time ago that one of my most important strengths, because I am a betweener, is to be a bridge builder. So I can be both, and I understand that a long time ago. Actually, I can be whatever I want, and being part of whatever I feel, and that is okay. Because I can bring people together and find our common causes. That is how I became a congresswoman in 2012 and pushed for a new mobility law in Mexico City. So that's part of this show, what I told you. And as you may see, we are very few women also there. Only the 15% of, of, of the Congress persons are women. That's the, the average. But well, let's, I wasn't always like this. I mean, this is very brand new for me. Uh, I used to be a, a very shy child who found that in written words a key to communicate with others. I was not able at that time to say a single word without being terrified. I used to be an earth too, and I found in books my whole world. It was easier and safer. I discovered my abilities on academic matters, and I used them to obtain a high-quality private education, becoming the first person in my family to achieve that. As you may see, that is my mom. The other person is my sister. And I, I'm part of a family with strong women. I mean, my mom is a very opinionated, opinionated person. She's always saying something, and she always has the reason, of course. And my sister, you can see with this, she has a very strong character too, a personality. So this is what my family is. Um, and well, my mom is a doctor. I come from a family of doctors, so community service was always the way of life for my parents. And they taught me the value of hard work in order to save lives. And that's part of who I am since then. That is why I believe in the power of change, knowing that the most important battles are fought in direct contact with people at a street level. This is the reason I found in the mobility and road safety agenda the greatest passion and my biggest cause in my political career. Because in our cities, the most important battles are fought at a street level, just as Janet Sadikan says. I have learned that even if the national public agenda goes into the most progressive battles, we just have to take a look into our public space and see if it is a democratic space. Our streets are inclusive or accessible. Does infrastructure respect the minority rights? Who are involved in the decision-making process of this urban policy? And how does this process, process exactly work? Do children, women, elder population, people with disabilities, pedestrians, cyclists, and public transport users in our streets are part of this democracy? I think that those are very good questions to start because we can speak about democracy every day and this part of, of, of the fashion of, of our uh, occidental countries, but we just have to take a look in the streets in order to answer this. And the answer is no, especially in Mexico. In most of the Mexican cities, the 80% of the road space it is driven into a car-oriented infrastructure, even if less than the 30% of the population owns a car, spending the 70% of infrastructure budget for them. May maybe someone you uh, know, Sonesimos uh, he Flores, he's one of, of, of my friends in Mexico City, and this is part of this beach, bridge builder that I was talking about. And it can be worse, public policy is being discussed and planned in a bureaucratic office without transparency, accountability, or responsiveness. We are not going to be a democratic society as we want to if we don't fix the in this inequality. Because the concept of a universal and safe street represents the core of the community engagement, a space for liberty and rights through social and economic development. 
There is nothing more inclusive than a community owning their own public spaces and using multimodal transport op options and safer streets without any kind of discrimination. The, ine the inequality in a society can be measured on the difference between the investment and the design of the streets. That is how the pedestrian agenda was born in my political timeline. And that is why the mobility law was born in Mexico City in 2012. And this is some examples when I was working in the Congress. The new mobility model in Mexico City was constructed over a strong collaborative effort through civil society engagement, government participation, and private sector cooperation. We created a, city, a citizen mobility council to work on that regulation, and that was part of the, of the hard job. This is part of also the, the, the community work that we were doing at that time. Through this framework, we started a new budget allocation as long-term investment strategy. From the failure of the car-oriented infrastructure into a bigger, greener mobility ecosystem. Also created institutional capacities and public policy for a sustainable model for the city. For the first time, the discretional decisions that the former um, mayors and also uh, directors of these transport systems, they were allocating all the budget for the, for the private uh, mobility and car-oriented infrastructure. So it was for the first time through this law that we started this change. At least it was written. The law had four pillars. The pedestrian at the center of the public policy, public transport system as the core of the mobility network, as a human right, of course, um, and walking and cycling as part of the mobility ecosystem too. So this is part of the work that we have been doing. We got, got, gather, gather together also the cyclists and the motorcyclists and the public transport users and everybody. It was a very open and a big and a communal conversation. It's this guy with, with uh, he's a motorcycle, a Harley one with his horns, very bad, but, but with this uh, sign that it is, we want the mobility law. Well, this is the new, the new pyramid, this one that you may see with the pedestrian at the top, and then the cyclist, and then the public transport users, and then the, the, the car users. This is one part of, of the work that we have been doing. This is in the chamber, in the votation that, that day. We started a big movement that it, that it was called Pedestrian First. We launched an app. And with that app, the people can start telling us all the failures in the infrastructure on the street in Mexico City in order to start mapping it. So it was a very good movement. At that time, it was the, 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 the number one app downloaded in the first week that we launched it. So it, it was interesting for the people, this conversation. So we work a lot on the street with, with people. And of course, the media, they were one of our biggest allies. And this is important. If you want to speak out your word, you have to work with the media. You have to work with the digital communication. This is essentially, this is not uh, um, a narcissist exercise of politics. The media and the public opinion is one of the strongest arms to do public policy. So that's what part, that was part of our uh, secret weapon. We also work with political leaders in the local sector because they were very important too. You have a lot of photographs over here. And we made it. We approved that law uh, as, a unanimate, uh, as, 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 as a unanimate decision in the, in, the, in the assembly. And until this part, you might think that it was fun and easy, a complete history of success, as you may say, but it wasn't. Being part of the local Congress in 2012 changed my political career, not just because of the success of the mobility law, but because it was one of the most difficult times of my life. And I think that this is the first time I'm going to speak out about this. I was trying to change the mobility model in Mexico City, but at the same time I was dealing with gender violence from the leader of my political party in the local Congress. I didn't recognize it from the beginning, his violent behavior. For him, I just had two options in order to be accepted in his team, to be seduced or to be subjected. I didn't accept it, of course. So his violence increased, trying to destroy my personal professional reputation and stopping my legislative work. I fought him back for the next two years, alone, thinking that maybe I could be fixed by my own or that maybe it was my fault at some level. 
I never realized that he will never stop because there was no problem at all. His problem was me being a woman and a very opinionated one. At the end of my period in the Congress, he succeeded. I was completely isolated from my political party and my main allies. Of course, we obtained the, the, the mobility law, but that was part of the shiny story. I felt alone, and I thought that my only way out was to present my resignation to my political party. So I did it. In 2015, when 15, with 15 years of being part of the PAN party, I went out. Today I recognize that I will manage better that terrible episode if I just had more experience. I had 29, 30 years old at that time. I didn't have the tools at that time, but also the institutional arrangement in politics in order to protect women was inexistent. That's why one of my biggest commitments right now is to prepare the next women regeneration in mobility. And I want them to be better and bolder than my generation with more comprehensive rules in order to protect us. So today in front of you, I will speak out and say this, me too. And this is part of what women have to battle and this is part of the challenges that we have to fight together. And for me, it's very important to be with you, united and together to defeat this. But yeah, thank you. But this story ain't over yet. I keep walking. I keep working with the civil society groups and media. And also I built new political allies. You have to find new friends if the other ones don't like you. In 2015, the mobility law was approved in the local Congress. And I was invited by Mayor Miguel Angel Mancera to be part of his cabinet as the head of the new mobility model office in Mexico City and later as a under Ministry of Mobility. And this is part of the announcement that the mayor did that day uh, with the other members of the cabinet that was also were, were invited at that time. He, he made changes and, and in the health period of his, of, of his administration. Um, in the past three years, we started a change in our policy and regulation. For example, our new comprehensive road safety program, introducing the Vision Zero Agenda for the mobility for the first time and three more disruptive regulations in mobility and urban development. The first in Latin America region, the transport network companies, where we opened the door for the Uber and Cabify services, the TNCs, and we were the first uh, uh, city in Latin America in order to do that. The parking regulation that decreased the number of parking spaces in the new urban developments too, it was part of our job in these three years of hard work. And the traffic regulation, one that among other things, lowers the vehicle speed limits in order to save lives. Yes, in Mexico City, the car city, we decreased the speed limits and we started to save lives on the, on the roads. The results, thank you. <laughs> That wasn't easy either. The people hate me because of that, but that's okay. It's part of my job. It wasn't the first time. Uh, so, um, yeah, um, the results are that we decrease in 18% the number of deaths in our roads with the decrease of the speed limits and with the safer infrastructure that we start to create in the intersections. We rescue the most dangerous ones in 173. It, it is a thousand, more or less, so we are just doing baby steps, but it, it is part of, 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 of the starting point that we w are working right now. And we are expanding our pedestrian, cyclist, and public transport infrastructure in 21%. Of course, this is not enough, but it is, it is the beginning of a new order. We have a new law, we have new planning tools, we have a new institutions, we create the mobility ministry, it wasn't at that time part of, of the administration. And we have right now a little but a tougher uh, team of technical persons who are working with this, specialized people who are working with this. Um, I have to say that through this experience, I found my political compass. And I understood that the core of my job was the civil society causes, not the political party interests. Now, I am an independent political actor. I am running for the Senate in Mexico City. And I work with all political parties, everybody. I am part and I am building a wide national and international network. 
I want to be part of the urban transformation of the region, and this is precisely uh, what, what I'm doing right now here with you. This is part of the work that we made at that time with the Vision Zero, with all the technical guidelines that we developed in Mexico City in order to start creating safer infrastructure and multimodal infrastructure. The police were one of our allies to implement the new traffic regulation because they, they are the ones who have the, the choice in order to do this. And of course, the public uh, participation in conferences, meetings, summits is very important because we were give, giving uh, all, the, all the results that we have been building. The FIA or, uh, Foundation also is a very important ally of us. This is part of the infrastructure that we are building right now in the city. This uh, intersection was a very dangerous one. Uh, the, all the, the infrastructure that you s may see right now, it was non-existent. It was all gray space for cars, and it was crazy for the people who wants to, to, to cross the, the intersection. And it was a, a school district too. So this is part of what we are working right now, a safer city for everybody, a more, a more inclusive one, a more uh, democratic one, of course. A completed street is part of our job. When you have um, um, a side line, do you have a proper line for buses? When you have a proper um, uh, sidewalk, or of course, safer intersections. So we have been working a lot the last three years in, in this. We signed the Yo Me Muevo initiative, that it is an initiative that all the NGOs launched in this political election in order to have uh, the compromise and the commitment of the commitment of, of the of the candidates in, with this agenda so this is this was important too because the all the candidates the senate ones and also the ones who are running for the for the for the city they already signed it And we have been working a lot, of course, with our partners in Latin America. This is Sergio Avellaneda. You may know him. He was, uh, he's the former Ministry of Transport in Sao Paulo. Also here we have a Paola Tapia. She is also former Ministry of Chile. Marta Serrano, she's working right now in Madrid in the, in the, um, in the um, transport direction. Also we have Lisa Castillo over here. She's former Ministry of Transport in Costa Rica. Daniela Chacón, she's counselor in Ecuador. Paula Bissau, she is Vice Ministry of Mobility in Buenos Aires. So we have been creating together this huge network in order to start working together. So that's why also I want today to announce you that this Thursday we are going to launch an Ibero-American initiative for women. We're going to uh, implement a leadership center for women. We want you to have more political skills in order to do your job. So I think that between you, we have great technical persons, technical women who are working in your, in your city officers or also, also in, your, in your private sector or in the civil society, but we want you to give more skills. Negotiation one, uh, crisis management, leadership, empowerment, so that's part of what we are going to do. And well, in 2012, we started a mobility movement in Mexico City, and we are constructing together activists, industry, universities, government, and a new model of urban governance. We, we believe in change, and one of the most important challenges of every urban area is to improve the quality of the life population. The congestion, pollution, crashes of the car-oriented model was jeopardizing it. So we need to change it and build a more accessible and inclusive model. This is how the new mobility model was born in Mexico City, changing the old roads intensive model to safer and sustainable public transport oriented one. This was a very big battle for the pedestrian in our city. The greatest honor in my life will be to change and achieve a long-term victory in this agenda, in which the next generation of mobility public servants and activists will continue the transformation of the mobility model, improving the results we have achieved. So maybe you are wondering now, okay, Laura, but what's the secret here? Keep walking. It doesn't matter if you are afraid. I mean, keep walking, especially if you are afraid. And don't stop. You will see that you will find yourself doing things that you didn't know that you were capable of. Second, teamwork. You don't have to walk alone. You are not alone. Find the people who share your passion and walk together. Thank you very much.
wasn't she amazing? <laughs> and don't you want to be that? <laughs> Thank you, Laura. That was really amazing. Uh, we are inspired to actually take action. We have been, but you are showing it. The next session is an interesting session. Uh, we have five speakers. Uh, it's part presentation, part panel. And it has a very interesting set of uh, actors, if you will. Uh, we have two uh, entrepreneurs uh, from Africa. Uh, we have a lecturer who's also an activist, uh, also from Africa. We have a city councilor from Latin America and a gender advocate turned technologist, if you will, from India. So let me welcome Esnam Nyado. Esnam, uh, if you don't already know, is Miss Taxi Ghana. So she was the first taxi driver, female taxi driver in Ghana, and now what she's doing is, is she's getting more and more women to actually get into this industry of driving. She's getting more and more women trained to be there. Thank you for doing that, Esnam. Uh, welcome to the stage, Daniela, Daniela Arias. Uh, Daniela is a counselor in the, in the city of Ecuador, uh, um, in the city of Quito in Ecuador. And she's been doing some big policy changes, so you could see her almost as a counterpart of Laura, in some senses, in Ecuador. Thank you. Uh, next, Amanda, the firebrand lecturer from Africa. <laughs> Uh, Amanda is a lecturer at the Makere University in Uganda, and she's also a bicycle advocate, uh, an activist. Uh, Kalpana? Dr. Kalpana Vishwanath. Uh, Kalpana is the co-founder. Kalpana is the co-founder of uh, Safety Pin. Safety Pin is an app uh, where you can map uh, various points in the city to find out how, how those points are, and she would speak a little more about what the app is, but also her story of how she came to see this as a means of, you know, essentially data as a means of advocating for creating uh, safer and better cities for women. And last but not the least, we have Kimberly, Kimberly Tour from uh, Liberia. So, so Kimberly is partly representing the Association of Liberian Construction Companies. Uh, Kimberly actually heads the first and is it the only uh, female-led construction company in Liberia and maybe in Africa. And you know this is great because you know construction is seen as such a male-dominated space that she's actually showing that it's possible for women to be there to be doing this work. And it's not that she just heads a company; she actually has women workers who are into the construction industry and making sure that they have the right space, they have their voice. So thank you all. So what we're gonna do in this session is this. So we will have each presenter uh, do a short little presentation telling their story uh, of how they came to be and what they're doing. And then we would have one of their other panelists, if you will, ask them a question on whatever they just told us, right? So Esnam, it's your, you should start, go ahead. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> My name is Esenam, Esenam Nyado, from Accra, Ghana. And if you can see up there, positive deviancy for development. My quest to become a taxi driver wasn't spontaneous. I earlier on was into several things. I went back to school to read social work major with psychology minor, introduced to gender issues and development, and then I started writing papers, wondering why the transport sector is 
male dominated. I zoomed in, was asking a lot of questions. Of course, I couldn't find that much of an answer. So I decided to step on a few toes by being a deviant for empowerment and for development. I started off, but before I tell you how I started off, there's the statistics in Accra. Over 6,000 male taxi drivers and only four female taxi drivers. It is such a male-dominated sector. When I started, I wanted to be a dump truck driver. We call it back at home as a tipper truck driver. So you have these dump trucks um, cutting sand, stones uh, to construction sites. Oh boy. You should hear the excuses, the male, you should hear the excuses. It was just impossible for them to understand me. So then, I needed to tone down my ambitions. After all, it was six months down the line trying to get a master driver to take me on as a trainee driver. So I asked myself, Esena, what can you do? Already you know how to drive. You've been driving since 1999. What else can you do? What's the way forward? Would you continue begging these master drivers to help you learn how to drive a dump truck? Then I said, ha, we've got a taxi. It's a smaller vehicle. I don't need anybody's permission to drive a taxi. Of course, I need to get my taxi license from the metropolis. When I got my taxi on credit, that's another issue, access to credit. So I got my taxi on credit, and the system works in this way. You work with the taxi, and then you pay up uh, for the vehicle as you work with it. The entry challenges. Oh, boy, you should hear. I attempted to um, join three taxi unions. You should hear them. <laughs> Just because some tissues decided to gather up themselves on my chest and not below the waistline, <laughs> they said, no, you're a woman. And I was like, huh, what about being a woman? Oh, they'll go like, I am, but you know, madam, you see, we have male drivers in our unions who don't have vehicles because probably it got broken down or the vehicle owner decided to fire our driver. Why don't you give your vehicle out to our driver or one of our drivers and then they would work with it and come pay you the rental fee every day. I'm like, no way, I want to drive. <laughs> they wouldn't budge. But I had to play smart with one of the unions. I went back to them and I said, um, guys, you know what? You wouldn't accept me formally in your union, you know? But uh, would you mind if I tag around you? I mean, I would come every day, park way behind your union. When you have clients come in and they make offers that you think is too little to accept, can you toss your rejected offers to me? And <laughs> They were so ignorant. They said, well, you can have all our rejects. <laughs> they never knew I was armed. I was armed with a call card, something the normal taxi driver in Accra would never do, have business cards or call cards. So very soon they were tossing their rejects to me, and these rejected clients ended up paying the exact amount these men were asking for, but I was getting it and then I was distributing and announcing my businesses to all these clients. By the time I could say one, two, three, most of the foreign embassies in Accra were calling me for services. I had been put on uh, the Canadian High Commission's list as an alternative transport provider, the American embassy, the German embassy. Ooh.
so you see, the persistent deviant, I didn't let it go. I didn't lose in that fight. Now, almost four years down the line, I'm five years old as a taxi driver, but four years down the line, I realized what I had wasn't just deviancy, it was a virus. <laughs> <laughs> a virus that was catching on like wildfire. Very soon, I was approached by Scania West Africa and GIZ Ghana, said, hey, yes, and I'm come. We have this idea and I think, you are the best person to help us out. We want to train female drivers to drive commuter buses, the BRT buses in Accra, and such an inspiration you are. Can you be the brand ambassador? I said, with all pleasures. I jumped on the project. From nowhere, I started running the campaign. Over 400 female applicants applied whereby the project stakeholders weren't sure even if we would have five. But then we had to streamline all the 400 and then we got to 72. Even though this one says 60, we ended up with 72. And these are women who have never sat on the driver's seat, never seen a pedal, never touched a steering wheel. Today, these women are maneuvering and managing these long buses, three-ton buses, on our streets. That is the virus we're talking about. As though I was, <laughs> thank you. As though that wasn't enough, something happened again. <laughs> that is it. Unapologetically, this time around, spreading a positive virus for development. The second project running concurrently is women moving trucks. And we're training women to drive trailer buses, uh, sorry, um, articulated trucks or trailer trucks. See the irony? I wanted to drive a dump truck. The men said no. <laughs> I bypassed that hurdle, can drive a three-ton bus. Now I'm driving a trailer truck and I'm helping other women based by the funding of GIZ Ghana and West, uh, Scania West Africa, we're training women to drive articulated trucks. In fact, they are fuel tank trucks. And this is what our ladies would be driving in the next three months. That is what we say, is empowerment. My name is Essenam. I'm an occupational gender desegregation activist. I don't know what you will call me, but I'm just a humanist who is fighting for equal opportunities as to how these uh, power sources of control are shared when it comes to economic participation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Asanam, for your story. It was quite uh, empowering, I would say. Thank you. So now's the time for Kimberly, for you to ask Asanam something about what she's doing and how does it connect to what you do? Do you have a question for her? Oh, OK. Um, so how are you motivating women to join your team? And uh, Esadam, I'll request you to be slightly uh, quick uh, because we don't have too much time. <laughs> the motivation is keep fighting with all the hurdles I had experienced. They see me crossing and jumping over these hurdles. That alone is motivational. It is a male-dominated sector and pampering wouldn't get the job done. I'm forging ahead. Thank you, thank you. Uh, next, Daniela, over to you. Yeah. Um, Can we have afternoon. Daniela's presentation, please? It's okay. Um, okay. Good afternoon to everybody. My name is Daniela Chacon. I'm a city councilor in Quito. 
Uh, thank you so much to the German Corporation for bringing me here. I'm really excited to be here, to be here, and to be um, sharing this moment with all of these aspiring women that have been talking throughout the whole day. Um, politics is in my veins. I'm a politician, and um, growing up, I never saw women in politics um, in my country, at least. Um, this is my beautiful city. Please come. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I, I grew up uh, in a world where, you know, women were not leaders, women were not politicians, and somehow I got politics in my veins, so I decided that that's what I wanted to do. And I uh, worked for it for several years, and in my country we have the parity law, which uh, makes political parties when you have a list for candidates to vote. If you have a, a, a man first, then you have a woman, or vice versa. And so I was working at the, at the current mayor's uh, in Quito campaign, and I was just, you know, speechwriter. And because I wanted to go into politics, and I thought that that was my, an entry. I didn't want to become part of any of the traditional political parties in, in my country, because, you know, they will, they will never, ever let a young woman <laughs> in their ranks. Uh, so I saw an opportunity in a new party, and I, you know, I, I went for it, and uh, I started as a speechwriter. And one time they were talking and they were like, you know what, we need, a w we need women for candidates because they couldn't be able to fill the lists. Uh, <laughs> because, you know, in political parties, mostly they're all men. And at the decision-making level, uh, still only men. So they, they, they didn't really have any women in mind. And I was like, hello, <laughs> here I am. <laughs> I'll run for office and then, you know, uh, the then candidate, now mayor, uh, asked me if I wanted to join the list, and I said, of course, and we won. And then they wanted a woman to, and I was elected city council for 2014 to 2019. I'm still a city councilor until uh, 2019. And then um, they needed a woman to become vice mayor. Uh, because, you know, the mayor was a man and it was politically correct. And I was like there. Hi, <laughs> I'm here. <laughs> and so I became vice mayor, and I was vice mayor until 2016. And then uh, the mayor asked me to negotiate with the Public Transportation uh, Guild the new uh, tariff system. And, okay, I have two minutes. <laughs> and that's how I became part of the transportation system. I said, again, I raised my hand and I said, yes, I'll do it. And uh, one of the things that I really, really uh, am compelled about is that the decision makers, the planners, transport planners, never use a bus, never walk, never use a bicycle, and they don't wear skirts. So <laughs> uh, being a woman, using bus, being sexually harassed in my city, many times in the buses and in the streets, I became an advocate for that. I created a uh, sexual harassment uh, program in my city that is called Cuéntame. Well, it was called Cuéntame, now has another name. And um, it's a program for women to be able to um, raise their voices when there has been, a, when they have suffered a sexually, uh, a sexual harassment case. And uh, we implemented this program in 2014. It's been 2019, it's, it's 2018 now. And we have over uh, 1,100 claims. Uh, we have 40 people that have been sentenced to prison for the very first time in my country. Uh, sexual harassment. <laughs> Thank you. And with this, I'll finish. Um, uh, for the very first time in my country, sexual harassment in public transportation is being talked about. Uh, I'm not gonna be here and stand up and here and say we have, we have solved the problem because we haven't, but it's part of the public conversation. It's not normal anymore, which is really important. And it's part of the policy making process. And the only way that we've, uh, we could have achieved this was because there was one woman in that table at one point saying, hey, I am being sexually harassed in the public transportation system if we wanna make good policies, if we want to make decisions for everybody, we need to take into account women's perspective. And um, that's how the program got money, political will, got funded, and now, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's growing, it's becoming much, much more important. And uh, the, I think the most important thing for me is when a young woman comes to me and says, you know, 
from now, uh, ever since the program started, I, I feel more safe when I use the public transportation system. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. And isn't that so gratifying, right? Um, Kalpna, you've been working a lot with politicians, administrators in India and elsewhere, even in Bogota and other places. Uh, do you have a question for Daniela on whatever yeah. she just yeah. told us about? Yeah. Um, I think uh, it's very, for a, a, a woman in any city to have someone in politics, in the government, who talks about sexual harassment is, I think, very empowering because most of the time, even the women who get into power sometimes have to defeminize and not talk about their experiences as women. So I think I just want to ask you, have you ever felt the need that you couldn't, that you had to sort of fit in with the men in this process of becoming an empowered counselor? Uh, well, it has been really difficult uh, because, you know, I'm usually the one that is always talking about the women issues. And, you know, here she goes again. Uh, <laughs> happens to me a lot. Uh, but um, I've, you know, I've never been shy away from it. it I've, I've had to find the strategies to make it, you know, to get to the point where they will listen to me. And sometimes I use, you know, statistics, some other times I use my personal experience, not, 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 not necessarily all the time the personal experience works because you know, it's not, it's not something that they can relate to so they, they will just have to take my word for it, uh, which works sometimes, but some other times you know, I use the statistics, I use um, benchmarking, you know, I find for every single thing that I wanna raise as a woman in an, in an all, men, all male um, table or where there's only few women, I find uh, the person that's gonna be my champion and I, and I understand what that person uh, wants, the information that he or she wants, and that's what I use, and it usually it has worked so far. <laughs> thank you, thank you. So over to you, Amanda. Thank you very much. Teachers always carry small notes, so I have some notes here with me. <laughs> um, my name is Amanda, you've been told, and I'm from Uganda. I have little time. Yes. I'm happy to be here. I see familiar faces in the audience. It's not what I always talk about. It's something new. <laughs> I asked some men earlier on how they feel to be here with us discussing women, mobilize women. And one of them honestly told me that he was feeling guilty. He said, no, but you're not the one doing all the planning work for the world. You're not responsible at all. No, but I think that we men can do something, he said. So I would like to salute all the men that made it to this conference to discuss women, <laughs> mobilize women. Um, we want to be mobile. We want to move. Nobody hates to be mobile. And to move should be a choice, and how to move should also be a choice. These stories we know we have had. We have statistics, we have reports, we have experienced, so you cannot uh, expect lessons today about it. And we shout about freedom, we shout about democracy. We are a democratic state, democratic government. But when you look in the road, the road system, you see what you actually have as a state, as a system. So somehow, we rule the world basing on lies because we can't see the truth. You see that man in the middle of the road, that is somewhere in, in uh, Uganda, northern part of Uganda. When people see that man, it looks normal. Someone said earlier that uh, when we plan, when men plan for transport, Transport is planned for men. But when I see this, I have another story to add on that statement. You see the man standing in the middle of the road, I think that could be his friend, maybe girlfriend, you never know. But this, this looks nice there, nobody shouts about it. But if it was a woman, another story is introduced. So what is this special thing about women and mobility? 
Safety is in the middle of it, of that story. And we cannot run away from it. Or is it something else? Is it gender? Is it, what is it about? That's Amanda from Uganda in Kampala. That's one of our nastiest roundabouts that we have to fight to uh, move across. And look at me there. To be honest, I'm not scared to be there. But so many people are scared to see me there. Including that man, see the gap he gives me? I put this up on my uh, Facebook page and there was a discussion. It's because you are a woman that they didn't knock you down, someone said. <laughs> so do you believe that? So, what is that story with a woman? Look at me there. No, that dress, you shouldn't ride your bicycle with that dress. The problem there is not the dress. It's not even the motorcycle, it's not even the car. It's, it's, but the bag, someone said, get another bag. <laughs> <laughs> so everything seems to be wrong somewhere, but nobody knows what is it. But the woman has introduced everything wrong in the system. <laughs> this is, you know this gentleman. <laughs> so when, when I put this up, it introduces another topic, huh? On a bicycle, oh, you got him. He also rides. So the discussion changes a little bit because this is a royal. I am not. I'm far from being royal. <laughs> but I'm a woman. That brings us again together on the same page. And then when you see that more than a woman comes into the story, you have the man, you have the baby, you have a family, you have society. And how does it look? It looks like this society will have no future. They will soon die because they will be knocked down. This family is finished. You know, those are the images that now keep growing and growing. And then I come back to the statement of when men plan for transport. They plan, oh no, transport is planned for men. And whoever plans for our men really hates our men. <laughs> what is this? This man is someone's husband, someone's brother. Look at, he's struggling because of an accident at a roundabout. That is not a plan at all, not for man, not for woman. This old woman is doing fine. I was told she was about 70, but look at her body, the owner of that bicycle. So it brings a story. This woman has been riding all her life. Why? Why did she choose to ride? And has it always been safe? So personally, as Amanda who rides from the city center, I'm challenged by this woman because in this town, women ride, it's normal. But when I ride, it's not normal and everybody is telling me one thing, don't wear a skirt. The second thing, you don't have a helmet, you shouldn't carry that bag but nobody tells this woman anything. It seems to be normal. And that's abnormal. I think the thinking is not right. So the woman in the story of safety and livable cities, we must discover what is in the woman in transport. The woman in transport means people in transport, society in transport. It's beyond woman. And that's why this conference is very important to me. It's not about feminism. This is about realism. I'm realistic. We all have to think straight beyond the woman, with the woman in mind. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. So, a question from the women in a taxi to a woman in a bicycle. Thank you, Amanda, for such great presentation. I would want to ask, um, your presentation makes me feel so guilty as a Ghanaian. <laughs> so, <laughs> we have no bicycling lane. I mean, if we do, it's just for some stretch of kilometers. How is this coming up in Uganda? We have bicycle lanes on paper. <laughs> they are soon coming on ground. <laughs> and 
Those bicycle lanes on paper are there because of a woman in me. I learned how to ride when I was old. So I was interested in trying this out in my country when I saw people riding bicycles. So I generated this project and it has been approved. Everything is perfect. We just have to see it on the road. And in my campaigns, I'm not telling people to get into the nasty situation, but I'm saying planners address this nasty situation. It's not the women, it's not the men, it's the situation. Over to you, Kalpna. Good afternoon. Um, as Shreya introduced me, I'm, I run a, a technology company and which works on data. I'm an extremely unlikely technology and data person. I uh, began my life as a sociologist and as a young woman asked this morning, I've always been a feminist and my work was as a gender activist working with cities to address violence against women. In 2013, uh, my co-founder, who is actually the technology person, and I were discussing uh, this whole uh, sort of rise in sexual violence and the, the sexual harassment in public spaces, and how do we ensure that you know, we can find a way to get people's voices to each other as well as to the government? Uh, and that was the time, you know, a lot of people were building apps. So, um, but of course, people who build apps are really, you know, 19-year-olds and 25-year-olds who build an app in, in five days and, they, you know, they're out in the market there. So, uh, in addition to, you know, not being a technologist, uh, I was also age-challenged in um, starting a technology company. <laughs> um, so, it has been quite a, a, a learning curve to be from, uh, you know, working in an NGO, working, you know, on safe cities, to actually starting a company and saying, okay, now we are going to use data. Because what we'd been doing before, I mean, my, I've been working on urban, um, urban planning and gender for many years now, more than 15 years. But in this avatar of mine, what I'm trying to say is that, how do we use data? How do we use data as a tool to ensure that governments respond to people's concerns in cities. We all know that sexual violence and sexual harassment in public spaces is a very serious problem. And I think that's been talked about since the morning about how do we access streets. But I also realize very strongly that unless we're able to access the street, we will never be equal. You know, the street is actually the most equal place in a city. And unless we're able to realize the potential of the street. So I come from a country which, uh, India, which uh, I'm sure all of you know that sexual violence and sexual harassment in public spaces is a very big problem. Uh, so, you know, I started this organization called Safety Pin. Uh, and, uh, you know, this is a public space in one of our cities and it's a crowded public space, but I do like this picture because it reflects an active public space. And I do believe this is how public spaces should be. And traditionally, many of our cities did have this kind of public spaces. But the introduction of the car and the introduction of planning for the car has changed the way that the public space is. And so we have a different imagination of what the public space should be. Um, but sexual harassment is not just an Indian problem. And I think that's something we all have to accept. It's a global problem. It's been talked about since the morning. There are enough statistics to show that around the world, 50% in a city, 60 in some city, 80 in some city, 90 in some city percent say they have faced sexual harassment either in the last year or in their lifetime. I think, you know, the Me Too movement brought into uh, sort of relief, the fact that this is really a serious problem. I think the time has come for us to say that, you know, the right to walk on the street is a, is a fundamental right, you know. Somehow, we've, we have willingly given up that right. We haven't fought enough for that right, and I think that's something we have to fight for. So the organization that I started is called Safety Pin, uh, and it's, we called it Safety Pin for uh, three reasons. One, uh, one is that a safety pin, uh, if you look at the app, 
when there's a, a, any um, report, there's a pin where it is. The second thing is a safety pin actually, if you know, is used to sort of keep something together. So we believe that as a tool, it would be used for uh, communities to work together. But finally, um, in India, and I don't know of other countries, many women of my generation carried safety pins when we went in buses, uh, so that if someone came very close to us, we could just poke them. So <laughs> a safety pin is something that women actually, uh, at least in India, we are very familiar with. So, um, so what do we do? The safety pin, uh, we do have a process called the safety audit. Okay, and we measure uh, these nine parameters, which is both um, infrastructure, but also the way a public space is used. It is not only infrastructure. Uh, we've, we, we did something very early, which was really to partner with uh, a media house and come up with ways of encouraging more people to use it. So this app is now nearly five years old, and we have about um, over 100,000 uh, downloads of the app in countries around the world. Uh, we've got um, data in about 30 cities globally, uh, in India, but in many other cities also. Uh, just to give you an idea, in addition to the individual user who can use the app to uh, see where the uh, city is safe, use it uh, to tell her how to get to the uh, place safest, as well as to give her own information, we also provide the data to city governments. So for example, in Delhi, this map shows you, uh, we show this to the city government to show that there were about 7,000 points in the city where there was complete darkness. There was no light. And the city government has used this data to actually uh, improve the lighting in the city. Uh, we also did some work around last mile connectivity because we did, as I said, the ability to move safely is not just landing up in a metro safely, but after you get off the metro or the bus stop, how do you get to your house safely? How do you get to your workplace? So we've done some work around that, and I think that is uh, the last mile and the first mile connectivity is something we need to work on as much as the more uh, sort of the train and the buses. And um, we did some work in Bogota, very interestingly, uh, on uh, auditing and mapping the bike paths in the city to see uh, and this data that was collected was used by the city government to both decide where to improve lighting as well as where to put the bicycle stands in the city. You know, so I think really, um, be as before I end, I think what I, I think is that today, most people are beginning to talk about smart cities. But what is a smart city? A smart city is not technology alone. Technology can only enhance or aid a solution. We have to understand that technology is not the solution. And I think that maybe if we have more sociologists who begin to do technology, we might understand this because very often, you know, the solution to safety problems in a city is seen as a CCTV camera. Now, a CCTV camera is not a solution. A CCTV camera is a tool that can aid in some situations. So I think really what I'd like to sort of end by saying is that we have to find ways of harnessing technology, harnessing data, because today in a world of data and technology, we must use it. As women, we must use it. But we must use it strategically, and we must understand its limitations as well, because at the end of the day, it's people's voices. It's what women say, they, what kind of a city that they want, which is going to bring about the change. Thank you. Thank you, Kalpna. Um, over to you, Daniela. Uh, what would you do as a city councillor to, I, I have um, a question as a city councillor to someone like Kalpna. I, um, um, I, I know that governments generally are afraid of data <laughs> <laughs> and transparency and publication of data because it shows that they're not doing well enough. Um, so I wonder what has been the main challenge for safety pin to be you know, adopted by governments and what have you done to um, face that challenge? Um, absolutely, that's the biggest challenge. Um, one is that if you give them data, because it's like, you know, it's like Winston Churchill said, there are three kinds of lies, lies, damned lies, and statistics. So when you give them statistics and numbers, they're like, where did you get this from? You know, uh, uh, maybe people are lying, you know, so it's always possible that people lie that they just think. So I think the challenge has been to be, um, as someone spoke this morning, is to be really persistent, is to, and we've, and I've had many um, 
lack of successes. You know, there are many city governments where we haven't been able to get them to use the data, to be honest. But we have had, because I do believe, like you and like many of the people sitting in this room, there are actually people today in government who want to see a change. And you have to find those right people. And when you find them, you have to stick to them till they are shunted out somewhere else. <laughs> so we really, it's, it's, a str it's a struggle and it's frustrating because you work all the time to build up a relationship with one person or one group and then they are transferred. At least in India, their bureaucrats are transferred all the time with no reason. So I think um, I could just say persistence and luck. I think sometimes, you know, if you're at the right place at the right time for someone to listen to, something happens and the world can change. Uh, maybe I should also say that persistence brings luck because if you're not, unless you're there all the time, you would not have be there at that instance when you actually have an opening. So uh, last, uh, Kimberly. So please tell us about how you're transforming the roads of Liberia with women power. Thank you. Um, first, I would like to start by thanking the organizers for giving me the opportunity to tell my story. Um, I am a construction contractor, entrepreneur, you may say, in construction. Um, my passion for construction comes from the heart. I grew up in a slum community where I remember uh, constantly being teased along with my neighbors um, about our community. And I was shocked the first time it happened because my family and I, I lived in a very beautiful, nice concrete house. And uh, I was really surprised because um, it was very new to me. Uh, but I couldn't imagine how my neighbors felt, uh, those who lived in shocked. So I remember growing up thinking that when I grow, when I get big, I would um, go into construction, build houses for families, so that uh, kids don't experience. This clicker, if you would like to use, if you want to use other slides, you have a clicker with you. Oh yeah, right there. Thank you. Uh, okay. Would so you want to go to the next slide? Right. Oh. Thank you. So I grew up, um, well, that is not exactly my neighborhood, but <laughs> yeah. So um, I grew up thinking that I will build houses for children so they don't experience what I experienced. And uh, over the years, I got into construction and I started to build low income houses and you know, in Africa, the credit line is kind of bad, so I got more into the contractor sector where we build houses for private uh, families, um, private entities who build for organizations and for government. So as you can see, I built a, a gas station for a company, and here I am in my construction gear. Um, in Liberia, 50% of the population has no access to roads. Like you said earlier, um, the needs of a rich country is different from the, need of the needs of a poor country. So where I'm from, we have serious difficulties with roads. And you know, without roads, there's really no systematic transportation. So this is why I have to bring in roads more in my dialogue. Um, with our roads, farmers cannot take produce to the marketplaces. And of course, that costs um, a neighborhood with our roads, you find fewer um, hospitals, schools, and a pregnant woman will have to walk like 20 to 30 minutes in labor before she gets to the hospital. 
because there's no transportation. And that caused uh, the, the youth to move away from that city. So the exodus of youth moving to cities, trying to find opportunities. And this is why you see some African young men desperately risking their lives on boats to Europe because there's no opportunity. And of course, roads creates economic growth. As a female, I, my experience with construction, working in, in the counties and in the, in the rural areas, I saw the condition of roads and I decided to get more into roads than building houses. But I realized quickly that the construction industry, especially when it comes to roads, is very brutal because men don't take women seriously. Uh, they believe that women should be secretaries, accountants, but never a company uh, owner, especially not a construction company, because they believe that women are not um, emotionally prepared for the pressure of construction. So that's another um, situation we women face in, in Liberia. And for that reason, the stigma is that um, it's there. And most women are discouraged because uh, they think that it is difficult to get jobs, to get contracts and projects. So some of them leave the industry for another uh, comfortable job or opportunities in other uh, construction or other areas. Now, I decided to organize a group of women in construction to have a voice so that we can be seen and heard because women suffer the most. Women suffer the most because we are the ones who have to take our children to school. And sometimes we have to walk them 30 minutes to school because we don't have the means of good roads and transportation. So in doing that, I have met with, sorry. Okay. So I've met with my fellow women where we discussed the way forward and we lobby we lobby, I've met, this is our new president, George Weir, President, president George Weir, and our former president, Ellen Johnson Salif. Um, we have been advocating, and that's the female group, part of the female group. We have about 35 females in the group, and I am the chairperson of that group. And uh, we have been advocating, thanks to GIZ for the opportunity they have built they have been working with us, training us, and creating um, capacity building, which is something that we really need in Liberia. We lack the skills, uh, uh, skilled workers. We lack of qualified uh, managers. And we, are also, we also lack of credit lines and equipment. So those are the challenges that we face as women in construction. So thank you very much. I know you're telling me time is up, so I have to go. Uh, but my last thing I would say, we as women, we should never give up. And this is why in what we do as African women in construction, we will not back down. We will fight until we get our voices heard. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Kimberly, and you know, I can completely understand where you're coming from. Um, I, as many would probably not know, but then I actually studied mechanical engineering, and <laughs> my first job was to design cycle rickshaws. And when I actually turned up at a workshop and I said, listen, we are gonna design the rickshaw this way, uh, and the guys were like, but what do you know about making rickshaws or making anything? And so I just sat down with them, cut pipes, steel pipes, bent them, and welded them. 
and they were like, oh my God, <laughs> you actually made it. And you know, the good news is actually this project, which started 20 years back in India, uh, presently has led to the uh, to about 500,000 rickshaws, cycle rickshaws in multiple cities in North India, which are providing transportation to about four to five million people. So it's possible if you're persistent, if you're there, and if you show it, you know, people start seeing, noticing. So be persistent, just do it. Uh, a question for uh, Kimberly from Amanda. Amanda, you're also, uh, other than being a bicycle activist, a teacher. So how can we skill, and you could probably ask that. Um, we have a situation of mobility having uh, an impact from construction, from shopping malls, huh? from buildings or, or roads constructed, determine um, how people use them or which mode is, uh, you understand that. So what is, what, what, what's um, the current situation in your country? Do you have the same clash? For example, when there is traffic congestion, we blame uh, the builders. When we have many people buying cars, we blame also the road constructors. For example, we have a policy for non-motorized transport, but the constructors do not pay attention to that policy. They just construct roads. So I don't know what you think about that, that complaint or clash. Well, um, before I answer your last question, in Liberia, we have only one shopping mall. And it's like, a, <laughs> yeah, in the whole country, literally one shopping mall. And it's very, very small. I think the stores in there is less than uh, 10 stores. <laughs> so that's how backward we are, unfortunately. Um, but um, when it comes to roads and the structure of roads, construction is, is very um, challenging. Most of the roads are not built for you know, a huge population. So in the city, we experience a whole lot of traffic. So this is why uh, our government is now putting out uh, projects for roads so that we can have better space to get around, to move around freely, if I answer your question, if I heard your question right. So, <laughs> thank you. Thank you. So, I hope you enjoyed that session. Uh, thank you all for sharing your stories. Uh, we would have a small little... Uh, next, we'd have a small little video uh, by UITP. Uh, it's called PT for Me. And so let's, let's see the video. And then uh, we also have with us Andrea Sonshen, uh, the business development manager at UITP. Please. Frantically walking home from the station. Frantically walking home from the station on an empty street after a late night shift. Impatientemente esperando el último bus. Impatientemente esperando el último bus en una parada de bus desierta. His eyes continuously leered at me through the rearview mirror. Nadie parece importante. These are some of the struggles in the daily These lives. These are some of, of the struggles in the daily the lives of real women all over the world. It has to change now. It has to change now. We have to do something about Public it. Public transport is the backbone of cities. Public transport is the backbone of cities. Life. It affects many our quality of life. Women's access in many to communities, education, jobs women's and access to education, in jobs other words, and health services. In other words, active participation actually depends on the Transport and quality UIT. of public transport. UITP is the only worldwide network to bring together all public transport stakeholders and all sustainable modes of transport.
The World Bank's overarching mission is to reduce poverty, improve living conditions and promote sustainable and comprehensive development in its developing member countries. UITP and the World Bank are teaming up to mainstream gender considerations in public transport to ensure a safe, inviting and comfortable public transport environment for women. بدي أحس بالراحة أكثر وأنا بالمواصلات العامة. بدي أحس بالأمان. To feel respected on public transport. To feel safe. Sentirme cómoda en el transporte público. Sentirme segura. Public transport me خوش هنا. Me فوس هنا. Kujiskia amani. Kujiskia salama. Public transport for me. 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 The World Bank is striking a chord here, which is actually not surprising because we as URTP, we actually decided to do something to advocate more safety and security for women and to put it onto a more prominent place in our working program. After we actually saw studies that perhaps have been mentioned here already in the morning, that about 70% of women using public transport have already experienced insecure and unsafe situations or sexual harassment. So that's of course way, way too much. And what we are intending as the, uh, I mean, URTP is the International Association of Public Transport Operators. You've just seen it. Our member companies count about, yeah, 1,500 in almost 100 countries around the world. So I believe if we can succeed raising the attention and mobilizing our members to do something, then hopefully public transport will be a much better option. And what we would like to change is to really see public transport and make people aware of public transport, A, as an opportunity for employment of women, but also to give them access to healthcare, to education, to jobs, which is crucial. And very often, we just heard it, there are, there are no roads, there are no services. So it is difficult and it's even more difficult so for women. So we are committed to mobilize our members and we can already see that actually, yeah, this seed starts to be growing. So the message seems to be received, and I hope in a not too distant future, we can come up with some success stories. And in the meantime, if you want to watch what we do, we would like that very much. Thank you, Andrea. So I know, um, we had lunch, we, had, we missed the siesta, but we had an exciting panel, and you'd all probably be aching for coffee. Uh, but we'll not have the real coffee, we'll have nonetheless a World Cafe next. <laughs> uh, so the World Cafe is a fairly simple format. Uh, you know, you see in the back, there are 12 tables. There are also 12 posters that you would see around in the room. Uh, what I would do is to invite each of the 12 poster presenters onto the dais. Uh, can I have you all, please? So each of them is going to make a one-minute pitch on what they're going to present in their poster session. You can choose more than one poster session because we would do at least three, but most probably four rounds of these of about 15 minutes each. So you can choose one and then move to the next one and the, and the next one after every 15 minutes to learn what has been done by each of these uh, projects. Please. Can you please come up? Um, so what I'll do is to give the mic over to you. Uh, please introduce yourself, your organization, and make a one-minute pitch on what you're presenting. Thank you. 
Um, hi, everybody. I'm Bronwyn Thornton. I'm with Walk 21, um, and we'll be talking about walking. Women walk more than men. They need. Uh, they make the decisions for their children about walking to school, and we'll be talking about the safety issues they face, as well as the ways we can make it better for them. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, my name is Jessica, and I'm part of FemiBisi. That's a feminist, grassroots, non-hierarchical collective from Western Mexico, Guadalajara City. And we are currently a group of 15 women. We do different things, and, but without uh, any funding from neither public nor private uh, sources. Uh, we do this by organizing uh, women's rights uh, for women and also open to everybody. Uh, we also have a bicycle school for women, and we also collaborate with other initiatives uh, on urban cycling and on feminism in the city and also around the country. Hello, everyone. My name is Marina Muscoso. I work at Despacio in Colombia. Um, Bogota was ranked as one of the worst cities for women in public transport, so we are digging into that data, we want to know how women move and we want to know how they feel and how, what, what are their experiences. And we also want to monitor public policy regarding um, gender and transport. So we have some preliminary findings of the research that we can show you and dig into the numbers and go a bit further in order to change that situation. Thank you. My name is Sonal. I'm with the Institute for Transportation and Development Policy in India. Um, in 2011, about 30% of India's population lived in cities, which is estimated to grow to about 600 million or about 40% in 2030. A high-powered committee estimated that about $490 billion would be required to invest in urban transport infrastructure. And while we have been seeing projects to improve women's experience of walking, cycling, and public transport, one of the big questions that really troubled us was that what could we do to influence these large investments in urban transport. What is a gendered mobility plan? How do we evaluate how gender is integrated into a mobility plan? And so ITDP, along with Safety Pin, um, uh, wrote, uh, co-authored co a policy brief on women and transport in Indian cities to actually understand how we could integrate gender tangibly, specifically, in our mobility plans. We'll, we'll be happy to share the process of how the policy brief was created and what are some of its substantive components. Thank you. Hello, my name is Ida, and I'm... Uh, get the mic a little closer to you. Oh, sure. <laughs> my name is Ida, I'm um, representing Where Is My Transport. Uh, we are a mobility, um, integrated mobility platform, uh, where we integrate formal and informal transport. Um, and rep informal transport in emerging markets representing 80% of all transport uh, makes this a hugely important task. Um, and we look to help improve cities and emerging markets make better investment decisions and decisions in planning. Thank you, good afternoon. My name's Heather, um, and we would like you to come to our table to hear about our project called Ella Sumueve Segura, which is She Moves Safely, and it's a study in three Latin American cities, one of which you've heard a little bit about, uh, Quito, Buenos Aires, and Santiago. We use the same methodology at the same time, and we have some very interesting results to show the common commonalities and the common challenges that women face, particularly when they're, work, they're riding public transport um, from a personal security perspective in these three cities. And we also developed a toolkit and a summary. And uh, we have to thank CAF and the FEAR Foundation for helping us do that. And Great. And, and besides all the data you're going to see in the, in the fact sheet and all the, the, the 
numbers and the stats that we've been hearing about, about 70% of uh, users feel that feel unsafe in public transport, um, and uh, many of those obviously are women. You will find out that you know women do not like to travel alone or at night or with children, and these are very common results that I think we'll see in many, a lot of the studies here presented. But I think uh, I'm just going to leave you one. Uh, I think. Uh, result or impact from a year-long study, and it was that um, the cities were very involved with the local teams, and they got to hear the voices of the civil society and the citizens, and this really catalyzed a, 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 a lot of actions from the cities that we're seeing now. So a, a year later of gathering information and presenting this information, um, it's really turning out into results. And like someone said, it's not all about the numbers, it's about livable cities, and I think the study did that, so thank you. Uh, hi. Hi, uh, my name is Amira Badron. I work at UN Habitat Egypt office. Uh, we support the government in planning for really changing this paradigm of, of planning for cars to planning for people. And um, through this, through promoting non-motorized transport tools and also a BRT system. So we're planning for the first BRT bus rapid transit system in Cairo to connect satellite cities to the central city. It's not going to be the first BRT system only, but it's also going to be the first gender sensitive BRT. Um, so we've partnered up with UN Women and um, to, to kind of incorporate this gender component into the system. Uh, we've, we've conducted a lot of surveys, we've come up with a lot of data, something that we don't have in Cairo on, on gender, specifically in transport, to better understand how women move, how, what are the challenges they face in public transport in Cairo, and we've come up with really interesting results that will feed into the service planning of the BRT system. So we invite you to come to and check out the poster and, and learn more about this project. Thank you. Hello, my name is Mary Mwangi from Kenya. I run an, an initiative called Fluent Initiative. Um, the initiative is women-led, and it was formed as a response to cases of stripping in the informal public transport in Kenya. Um, we work mainly to change behavior change, uh, to change behavior change of public transport operators and thus create safe spaces for both women commuters and women operators. We do so by implementing two main programs, one of, whom, one of which is called Usalama wa Uma in Kiswahili, and in English it's Public Safety Certificate Program that works to empower male operators with skills on gender mainstreaming and prevention of sexual harassment personal and professional development and customer service. Through the program we use, we train or equip men with skills to be protectors of women uh, because previously they have been uh, perpetrators of sexual, violent, sexual harassment against women using public transport. The second program is called Women in Transport, which we uh, hope to attract women to work in the public transport sector in Kenya. And when I say the public transport, I mean the informal public transport system, uh, which mainly include the matatus, which are the mini buses, 14-seater mini buses. The buses, the border border, which is the motorcycle ride. And, and in the um, ship, uh, taxis. Um, so, um, <laughs> Still, under the women um, in transport, we've realized that so many of our female operators have been going through a lot of stereotyping and a lot of stigmatization working in the male-dominated domin informal public transport where, uh, and as a result, we are currently in the process of developing uh, a storytelling session where we will develop a theater piece that will be aired to members of the public to be able to understand exactly who a female operator is, their experiences, their challenges, and the opportunities that are in the public transport, and that will be able to create an image, an acceptable and an actual image in the minds of public transport users. Thank you. Hi, my name is Marcela, and I am with OpenStreet Cape Town. 
Uh, please join me and my colleague Rebecca at our table to hear um, a little bit about the project which started six years ago. It's about using streets as public spaces, we all know, um, and to learn a little bit about the experiments that we've been doing on the street. And because I know we're competing with amazing projects here, if you're not convinced, come and get some really cool stickers. Um, and we're here to also hear your questions and you know, help us through the future because we're a very young organization. Thank you. I also had such a smart idea to bring stickers along. Uh, but this, this is a very unique stickers. There are not too many left. <laughs> Okay, I'm from, uh, I'm from Russia actually, working for German Corporation for GIZ in Liberia. And uh, Kimberly already showed some challenges in Liberia, of work in Liberia for transport and for roads. And me and Kimberly and my colleague Wanda uh, will be presenting our GIZ project capacity development in the transport sector. And for those lucky ones who are there at the table with us, uh, I can also um, put on a small, um, the first draft of the song of road safety song for, for building awareness for road safety in Liberia. And also, of course, discuss uh, sustainable financing for roads, how to construct uh, and how to maintain roads, and also how important employment promotion and uh, vocational training in Liberia. So come along and we will. Uh, how give you with uh, big smiles of three of us? Thank you. Hi, uh, my name is Christina and I have no stickers with me. <laughs> but I have our Buffalo bicycle with us. And uh, um, what is special about that bike? It's very simple. But it's designed to carry 100 kilograms on the rear carrier. What is good for? We probably already heard that the bicycles are probably done more to, um, um, to emancipate women than anything else in the world. Why that? Because it's making, it's mobilizing women. And that's what World Bicycle Relief, Relief does. World Bicycle Relief is an international non-for-profit organization that mobilizes people through the power of bicycles. Uh, we provide bicycles, uh, um, many of them go to education sector, uh, mobilizing students, most of them girls, helping them to, uh, to reach schools uh, faster. Because if you have a bicycle, you can move at least four times faster than without a bike. And also carry five times more weight, no matter if it's water that you have to fetch prior to go to school, milk, medicines, patients, or whatever. To learn more, come and see me. Thanks. Hello. Hello, I'm Anna Gehring from Verkehr mit Köpfchen from Heidelberg, see in Germany. Um, I'd like to present today um, my project on the poster cycling during pregnancy and with a baby. Because, as you all know, women are getting pregnancy maybe once in a lifetime or more. And it's also possible um, going by bicycle when you are pregnant. And you're more than welcome to um, talk to me about cycling during pregnancy and also after the birth with the child, with the baby, when the baby cannot sit by its own. Yeah, thank you. Yes, um, again, guidance to all the cafe uh, owners. Uh, please run your session for 15.